Today we are in West Lockinge, home of former Gold Cup winning trainer Henrietta Knight. Thank you very much for letting me come and see you today. Very nice to see you, Ryan. Lovely to have you here. It's been a long, long time ago since I was last here, when the great best mate was here, and Edge Dombler, and many, many more, even Terry. Mm. You often used to come down and visit them. Lots of pictures of you as a little boy. <laughs> in the days when best mate was turned out in the field with Edward Dombler, you used to get your picture taken. What a great, great time that was and the memories I've got looking back at the camcorders going up in the field with Edger Dombler and the great best mate um, times like that I've never missed you know so um, you, you finished training in the 2012 and from then on you were going to come out of racing what what has gone on from then well I came out of it in 20 in 2012 because Terry was very ill and then Terry sadly died in 2014 but um I couldn't get racing out of my blood and I thought well having lost Terry, given up my license, I'll just sort of fade into oblivion and do something different. I wrote a book about Terry and my life with him and then I got so much in response from the book and so much, so many enthusiastic people around who um, wanted to re-involve me in racing that I decided to write a second book. Um, this book here called The Jumping Game, and I visited 28 trainers in a year in Ireland and England to see how they trained their horses. It's got me right back into it, and uh, I love being part of it, and I still buy horses for people, I go racing, and I'm quite clued up with what's going on. You went over to Ireland with your new book um, to see their trainers over there, and I know you went to mm -hmm. Gordon Elliott's, which you think very highly regard as a mm -hmm. big trainer in the upcoming days. Gordon's fantastic. Comes from a totally non-racing background. He's a genius with horses and he has got away with his staff and running his yard that just stands out. Brilliant man. Very, very, very dedicated and he deserves all the success he gets. And he loves this great horse that's just come into the picture this last year, Sam Crow. And I know he's been telling you all about him over there. Yeah, I've seen Sam Crow many times when I've been over there. I'm going over there again shortly before Cheltenham. But um, he's a magnificent horse. And he could be one that goes down in the in the history books of racing for many, many years. Because I think he could be a, a real champion. Yes, the way he won at Leopardstown last time. Um, it looks like he might be a next Channel Festival winner this coming March. Well, I hope so. He ought to win whatever race he goes in, barring accidents, because he's, uh, he's a bit special. I see um, he's followed on your footsteps with the loose school, so you used to love getting horses to jump in your loose school, and I know he's took the dimensions from you. Yeah, he's got a, a new school, and um, he's very pleased with it, and all his horses are, young horses are learning to jump loose. Quite a number of trainers believe in this loose jumping. Um, Definitely Henry de Bromhead likes jumping in the loose. And uh, if there is are the opportunities to jump a horse loose, it's great because they aren't, don't get the interference of a rider. Terry always used to say, it's the riders that cause the trouble because they uh, unbalance them or catch them in the mouth, let the horse learn without a rider and then put the rider on board. And this is what I like about Bryony Frost. I think she lets the horse jump mm. and what, what do you mm. feel with, with the women jockeys coming through now mm. as the, well? Um, a fence ought to be come to the horse. You don't ride the horse into the fence. You let the fence come to him. And uh, you sit quiet and you don't interfere with the horse. And that's where I think Brownie is so good because she... Then you inspire the horses with confidence. Yes. And she's she gives them so much confidence and... And she balances them and she doesn't get them off off balance. Um, she just sits quiet. And that's that's basically what Best Mate was like, you know. The he Jim Clotty never did a lot with Best Mate because he was such a good jumper. That was his mm. huge asset. Yeah, you know, Terry used to say to Jim, just just sit quiet and don't move on him. Leave the jumping to the horse. Uh, whereas some jockeys you see them, you know, they're all over the place. They're 
ahead of the horse, behind the horse, arms in the air. And it's very, um, must be very putting off for the horse. And it used to take a lot out of Best Mate, each, each run. Mm, it used to take a lot out of Best Mate. And he wouldn't have managed to have run many more times in the year. He'd have been a spent force. We never have won three Gold Cups with him. He was he was remarkable, and the the criticism that you used to get when you used to keep best mate just for the Gold Cup, did it ever get to you? Did it ever? Did you ever lose any sleep from it? No, no not really. It didn't lose any sleep at all because I believe that what we were doing was right for that horse, and that we had one goal, which was the Gold Cup. And quite honestly, um, whatever people said about it. Too bad, and it's up to they say what they like. Didn't it wasn't going to change me or Terry, we we or the owner. That was it. We would we were channeled into the gold cup, and, and we just listened to the um, criticisms, and just took it with a pinch of salt. And nowadays, you see these good horses like Altior. He will have had one race before he runs in the Champion Chase. Um, uh, the horse of Native Chester, River. Native River. He'll have had one chase before he runs in the gold cup. And uh, Road to Respect of Noel Mead. He didn't run him in the festival at Dublin because he's keeping him for the gold. Yes. And now the trainers are doing the same thing and it's, it's quite um, pleasing. Have you looked back and thought, I wouldn't have trained that way? Or, I've, or they've actually followed me with their training? Um, some of the things I think they have followed me with because we didn't used to run Best Mate very often. And we used to keep him on ice for the gold cup and they always used to say I used to wrap him up in cotton wool but it paid off and now they seem to be doing the same with the top horses yes. and not racing them very often and waiting for the big race because you can't race a horse too often because there's only a limited number of races in any horse and when they go in the big races they say well the lesser horses race and race and race they may do but they don't they don't they're not so good and they don't put all their the effort into it but the good horses, it's like the Olympic runners. So Best Mate, where did you discover Best Mate? Where, where did he come from? And we discovered him in Ireland in an Irish point to point. And he did stand out as he walked around the paddock. I mean, he had that air about him. A good horse knows he's good and he has a special look. And he just walked around there and said, sort of look at me, I'm, I'm enjoying this and you can enjoy me. Didn't he pull up on the first run? Yeah, he pulled up on his first run, which often happens in the Irish pointer points. They go around for a school. And um, then uh, he won the next race against a mare, just a two-horse race. But the mare wasn't too bad. She came over to England. I think she went to Henry Daly and she won a couple of races. So she wasn't a bad mare. Yes. But he was just superior. I mean, mostly a gelding is superior. Um, but, you know, he was just special. And I think Florida Pearl come out of uh, one of those point to points, and it was it the year after. He also came from the Costellos. Yes. And what, the year when Best Mate was beaten in the, the um, King George, Florida Pearl beat Best Mate, and they were both Costello horses. And we go on about A.P. McCoy, the, the the great A.P. McCoy, and he rode Best Mate to win one of the King Georges, but he did get beat on that day when Florida Pearl. I think probably if he'd known him better, and he sat quiet on him and produced, let him run on a bit more he'd have probably won two but he hadn't ridden him before in a race and so it was all new to him and the horse had always been ridden by Jim yes so he was Jim Cullity dependent yes he was he was remarkable and that was what was great with with the jumping you know he used to gain a length every jump he used to jump yeah. well he didn't waste any time in the air and he he always judged the fences perfectly he only um, made one mistake I think in his life which was his first chase round Cheltenham and uh, he learnt from it didn't affect the result no and uh, he never fell in his life so these good horses you you feel that they can run on over any trip as you see I you dropped him back for the two mile one Holden Gold mm. Cup when he just mm. beat Seabold and I know yeah. with Edgar Blur. a good horse should be able to run on over any trip and uh, see so he won he should have won probably the Supreme Novices over two miles at Cheltenham he didn't run in the Arkle because that was the year of the foot and mouth and it was called off. He was favourite for the Arkle and that was two miles. But he his, he had the ability to stay and produce that, that little bit of speed at the end in the in the three mile races too. Yes. So what goes back, so we go back to your training career and 
do you think a lot of it has changed recently? Would you like to train now? No, I wouldn't know how to start. Um, I think it's very important to have a big team behind you. Uh, it's become more professional and there are bigger yards all over the country. Some of the yards have, you know, two or three, two, 200 plus horses. Yes. I mean, uh, you've got to have numbers to win the races because it's so competitive. The, um, in my day, there were none of, none of the social media. So there was no, there were no computers. There was nothing up on a screen. There were no mobile phones. Everything was slower. Now it's so competitive and cutthroat and the prices of the horses have gone up. You've got to get very good owners, trusting owners who prepare to pay big prices to get the top horses. And not always the money that buys the best horses. What do you think they need to do to racing to make it better and make it what everyone wants? As I see, that they've just introduced maybe a championship races um, for the National Hunt, which is going to chuck out a lot of small trainers. I know, well, everybody likes to see the cream. There's no doubt about it. And that's what gets written about and gets what's shown on the television. But um, I suppose unless you've got shop window in the top races you don't have people wanting to buy into the, the sport having said that you've got to think of the, the, the smaller trainer a lot of trainers gone dual training and mm. as Gordon Elliott mm. it, it's incredible how you can dual train because there's not many successful trainers out there that well um Joseph O'Brien's doing the dual training he's very good at his job and he's just as good with his flat horses as he is with his jumpers but, and Jessica Harrington is another person who does it both ways, and Alan King in this country. They're, they're good trainers, and they, they do mix the flat with the jumping. Uh, they're just horse people. They're horsemen and horsewomen. So, you know, they just, they're just good at what they're doing. So we've got, I asked the public to ask a few questions to you, and um, we've got a couple of people that have mentioned um, about... Terry, so what was what did Terry input into the training that, that hugely came out into the um, horses here? Well, he had so much experience from having ridden on virtually every race course in the country. Foss Lass wasn't going in his day and he never rode at Fakenham. But apart from that, he knew all the race courses. He, could, he was a tremendous help to the jockeys, brilliant at finding their faults and helping them with their faults. And teaching them at home and telling them how to ride races so he, he was brilliant with the jockeys he was very good with the staff because he was always laughing and joking and and it kept a happy yard you know he really had everybody enjoying life and he was very observant of the horses and he knew when the horses were right he used to watch them for endlessly on the gallops and he would say to me hen i don't think that horse is quite right at the moment i think we should ease up on him or we should do something else with him. Yes. Uh, and he was such a support to me. I mean, he just backed me up with everything I wanted to do. We argued like mad. We argued non-stop. But we argued because it, out of it all, out of the arguments, we probably got the right answers. And it was very, it was a very good thing to argue. And from Mike Tudor, he said, um, what horse would you like to train that's out there now? Sam Crow. <laughs> I just think he's, well, he's magic. But there were some very good horses. I think I might be too scared to train out here. He's so precious, but he's so lovely. Um, those two horses are very, very good. I hope they both win at Cheltenham. If you could have a favourite King George winner, who would it be? Best mate or Edra Dombleur? Probably Edra Dombleur, because it was such a wonderful surprise. And that was the race I was there. I wasn't there for best mate's victory because I'd gone to Wood Canton on the same day to see best, to see Edward Omblo run in another race there. But that, that day when he won, it was just um, extraordinary, really. And I Terry always it. thought he'd stay. He always thought he'd stay. I don't know whether he really thought he'd win, but he always <laughs> thought he'd stay. 33 to 1, wasn't he? 33 to 1. Mm. Uh, unbelievable. I still remember the day, actually, when I was very, very young. Mm. Like a little tiger he was. Oh, he was just so great. His jumping was great as well. So he was... He was actually quite slow, wasn't he? He's very slow at home. And he used to get very depressed if a horse went past him. He'd just say, well, okay, 
you go past me and I'll just drop the lot and you just have dropped the bridle, you know, and just give up. So we had to keep him interested and make him think he was better than he was at home. But in a, in a race, he was quicker than best mate over the fence. He was lightningly quick. And he, by the t time he'd landed, he'd gone. And the other horses were landing and getting going again. But Edredon won all his races by this amazing ability he had to jump and gallop. Uh, with such speed. No one else would have won on him in that Queen Mother Champion chase other than A.P. McCoy. Nobody, nobody. He picked him up and he carried him and he, he inspired him and it was just brilliant. He actually got headed, didn't he? And then he battled mm. back and mm. it was the head on the line mm. for a two-mile to then a three-mile King George winner. He was so tenacious, that little horse, and he was great and he's still alive now and he's still out enjoying himself in the paddocks, so it's great. And there's one more question from Mike Tudor. Who would you have if you would, could retain a jockey if you were training now? Brown Hughes, without any shadow of doubt. I think he's a top-class jockey. Um, he's somebody you can talk to. He knows the game. He's very clued up. And he's underrated, but he always keeps himself up in the north because he's a, he's a king up there. I mean, he wins right, so many winners. There are some very good young jockeys coming through. And obviously... Um, in this country, there's obviously you know, James Bowen, and there's, in Ireland, there's Jack Kennedy. But um, if anybody said you're going to start training again, pick a stable jockey, I wouldn't hesitate to ask Brian Hughes. Yes, king, king of the northern racing. Mm. So what, what's, your next, what's the next chapter going to bring for you, Anne? So I know you do a lot of pre-training. We do a lot of pre-training. We do a lot of teaching horses to jump here. And... Um, we do a lot of uh, um, breaking horses in as well now. But I love buying and selling horses. I love finding horses for people. And if anybody wants, to, wants a racehorse, I'll go out and find it. I mean, although I say it myself, I think I have a good eye for a horse. I certainly had a trained eye. I've been doing it all my life. And I know what I'm looking for. And I've got some very good contacts, especially in Ireland. And I'll see how the book goes and see how it goes down with the public. And uh, who knows, I might start writing another one. So do you, you keep a few of Tim Radford's horses and pre-train them? I know he's very loyal to you when you were training. Yes, he's a very good man to me. And now, of course, he sponsors the Cheltenham Gold Cup, the Timico Gold Cup. Yes. Um, fantastic man, and he's bought some lovely horses. We have a few of them here before they go into training with either Mick Shannon or um, Dan Skelton. But I have a lot of good horses here. They go to different trainers. I'm very proud of what we've got looking out of the stable doors in the yard. Lovely horses. And to get up in the morning and go and feed them, which I do every morning. Get up every morning half past five and I go out and feed them myself. And it, it's something to get up for. And I just love horses. I've just got horses in my blood. I've always loved horses and my life revolves around them. They'll, they'll never leave me. And do you have any Connemaras still? I have a few Connemaras. But they don't live in the stables, they live out in the fields. <laughs> so in the winter, I don't see so much of them. In the summer, when they're, I see them closer to home and they have their foals. But it, I, I couldn't have a stable empty in the yard. It's got to have a horse inside it. Yes. And, and just to be able to talk to the horses in the morning and observe them. And, and it's just the feel of them and the smell of them and, the, and their, their characters. And I just love them. It's um, it's it's great to have been able to meet you, Henrietta, and uh, got it. I'll never forget the memories that we had when we were, when I was younger. So um, it's it's with great pleasure. Thank you very much for letting me. Well, it's lovely to see you again, Ryan, and um, hope you carry on enjoying your racing as much as you obviously are. And fingers crossed, this book in March it's published. Yes, yeah, coming out in March. And and um, they seem the people who had a pre copy of it seem to be quite enjoying reading it. It's more, a bit more like an encyclopedia, but um, it's, um, I think people will learn a lot from it.